Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin Roundup podcast presented by Coinbits. We bring Bitcoin news, hot topics of conversation, and deep dives into a variety of Bitcoin topics to you weekly. We are Coinbits, a Bitcoin financial services company. Check us out at coinbits.app. This recording is for informational purposes only. No investment or legal or any other advice should be drawn from this content. And as always, consult an advisor before making any legal or financial decisions. Alex, how's it going? Right. It's been a while since I've been on Spaces. I was enjoying having no Twitter app on my damn phone. I thought you could do it from desktop, but you fucking can't. It's such a pain in the nose. Yeah, yeah. It's nice having not having it on your phone. You're not always like uh, wasting time checking it and all that. You can actually like be productive. It's a total fucking time sucking vortex, man. Honestly, <laughs> like, cause you just, you know, you see one thing and then you're like, oh, right, this is uh, just another 30 seconds. And talking about Twitter something. in general or spaces? Twitter in general. The thing is, it's like, you know, you're compelled to tell the world what you think and no one really gives a fuck anyway. So that's true. But I do believe, I, I do completely agree. You just get your attention just gets grabbed by you know, whatever topic that, or topics you may be interested in. And then all of a sudden you look up and X amount of time went by and you don't even know how. Yeah, totally. I think I might do what VJ did. VJ was really smart. He, you know how he does this whole, like, he just follows one person and it's like a single per like one person this month and each month he just follows one new person. I think I might just do that. Just fucking wipe my whole following list and yeah, clean up everything. Yeah, that's a good strategy to, to put limits on yourself because you said before it's infinite mm -hmm. just go down these holes and never come out yeah but anyway what are we doing today right now we're doing a well, coin and chill friday with uh alex Vetsky. so we'd love to get started thank you Tim. yeah and on that note you know alex we spoke a little bit before this about maybe some topics that we want to touch on so you know it's just an open space to talk about whatever we deem most important and with that i would uh hand it over to david and we can get it going yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, first I initially wanted to ask you about fiat collectivism, but I saw that you just had an article that went up on Bitcoin magazine mm -hmm. uh, called the good, the bad and the ugly from 2022. And I've just scrolled through it and you have some, I love how, first of all, I love how you call crypto crapto. Like you're just, you have all these like really funny, uh, like little kind of ways that you word things, but they're so accurate. And I was wondering if you'd kick us off giving an overview of that article and what your thought process was behind, uh, behind that. Yeah, I wanted to, I, I wanted to start off the year with a different tonality in my articles. You know, I wrote one final article at the end of last year, which was the uh, fourth part to the remnant series. And it was, you know, quite brutal. Now I actually didn't write that in December. I only published it in December. I actually wrote it back in July of, uh. 2022 and it was you know it was like one of my most hard-hitting sort of articles which was basically you know the premise of it was i don't believe anyone who says you know they're in bitcoin to help the starving children in africa you know and like whenever people try to pull these altruistic sort of motifs I run the other way and, and for me the reason i'm in bitcoin is because it's right and it's the honorable and moral uh, thing to do and even if in the short term that gives uh you know my competitor an advantage, it's still the fucking right thing to do. So you know, the philosophy there is this kind of ancient idea of you win because you're better, not because you cheated. And the world I think is so fucking upside down at the moment because winning requires cheating or, you know, requires bending or breaking the rules in some way, shape or form, or at least at the very least being friends with those who bend the rules and by, you know, association, you sort of become an accomplice you know, to that stupidity. So. Anyway, like the last article was like a real hard hitter and, you know, as usual, people got butt hurt and, you know, why are you so angry and all this sort of shit. So anyway, I wanted to write something with a different tone and, you know, this article was, I just said, look, all right, let's look at what last year was about. And I always loved that framing, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, what was actually good, you know, what was genuine and what was just ugly. And to me, ugly is like, you know, is a synonym for immoral you know, or, or, you know, dishonorable, or, you know, that sort of, and, you know, there was a lot like, you know, the good was in many ways, we had a very necessary cleanup, uh, cleanup of the shit coiners, cleanup of the Ponzi's cleanup, even of a lot of the crap that was coming into Bitcoin. I feel like there was so much Ethereum envy, you know, 
there was a lot of VC money flowing around investing into stupid ideas that because they said the word Bitcoin or, you know, in some way, shape or form were distantly associated with building on Bitcoin, whatever the fuck that means. They were all, as I saw it, Ethereum envy projects that were, you know, infinity scamming with the word Bitcoin. And, you know, a lot of that shit all got cleaned up. And even the inflated valuations that Bitcoin companies, you know, were sort of uh, benefiting from in some sense, you know, that shit all got cleaned up too. You know, it was, you know, the good largely revolved around sort of cleanup and vindication and, you know, seeing the Sam Bankman breeds of the world and all that sort of stuff, you know, get wiped. Not that, not that he's probably going to face any justice on this planet, but, you know, it's maybe in the next flight. You know, and then sort of the bad was, you know, I think we've moved closer to the world, world of uh, CBDCs. I think that was one thing I sort of pulled up, which, you know, people can go in and explore a little bit further on my thoughts there. You know, perhaps in this one, I'm not sure, you know, whether this is true or not, but maybe there's been a delay towards hyper-Bitcoinization, at least in the sense that, you know, so much time, money, and energy is just being wasted on shit uh, in the peripheries. And then the third one that I pulled up, you know, is uh, is one where I, I think has been a big problem of 2022. And, you know, I've always been framed or perceived or viewed as like a, you know, quote unquote, toxic Bitcoin maximalists. But, you know, and this is not me talking to breed love, you know, I'm holier than now. It's like, there's a place for that shit. You know, there's a place to sort of, you know, uh, challenge people and, you know, tear the ones down that need to be torn down. Like, you know, the Udis of the world are great examples. But I feel like there was just a whole lot of excessive infighting. And I don't know whether that stems from, you know, this kind of lack of wealth effect, you know, when Bitcoin's 60, 70, 80 K, you know, you're feeling good and you're less likely to, you know, beat up, you know, the man on your right. But I feel like there was a lot more of that in 2022. And I think that's just sort of a function of probably frustration at you know, what a lot of us thought was, you know, you know or changing, we, we, there's a phase shift in the way we perceive Bitcoin and our own relative wealth in that sense. At, at least people that have been around since, you know, 2018, I think the school of 2020 and 2021, this has been a godsend for them by and large, because they're, they've able to hit whole coin status or multi coin status. So anyway, so there's that kind of like, you know, let down in terms of, you know, people's natural wealth effect. And then the other thing is just how dumb the world's been over the last three years. Like I honestly, have, you know, like a lot of my content just became quite, you know, bitter and frustrated. You know, it was like this lashing out at, uh, you know, this enemy that you can't really do any, you know, sure you can stack some Bitcoin and, you know, other than, you know, you write some articles and yell at people but other than that like yeah, there's nothing you can really do about clown world except watch and i think you know a lot of that frustration you know was channeled uh in sort of weird and wonderful ways so you know my, my hope and you know, i guess this is the saying it's like be the change you want to see in the world is like i hope that you know some of that discourse will improve and people get a little bit better at focusing their vitriol you know, where it counts. So that was like the, what I thought was, you know, the bad. And then the ugly was really focused around like the lack of consequences for basically, you know, all the people that effectively just robbed their customers blind. And I, you know, what I did in the ugly piece, uh, or the ugly section of this article was I basically compared scam bankman fraud with, uh, Mashinsky and Suzu and Oquan, whatever the fuck his name is with, with Snowden, Assange and Russ Albright, right? Like you got three people who did nothing wrong, who did a bunch of good shit, spoke the truth. They're all fucking either in hiding or in prison. And you got four assholes who just fucking blatantly scammed everyone. And they're flying around on those class jets, you know, posting $250 million bail. And for me, that was like probably the, you know, the summation of 2022. It's like complete inverted justice. And yeah, that was like the point of the article. And I, you know, my ending was, you know, let's hope in 2023, uh, we can at least, you know, minimize some of the bad, you know, build on what's good and recognize that, you know, they're here to stay for a little while until we you know, think fundamentally. So anyway, that's like a overview with some context that's useful. If I can chime in here, I love that. And the. You know, what you said in the beginning about Bitcoin not being charity, so to speak, and, you know, I'm raising, so if I get anything incorrect, please correct me. But, you know, people who say that they're in Bitcoin necessarily for 
altic reasons. And I think there's a degree of that for sure. But you're saying, and there definitely is, but you're saying that, you know, you're not in it for that, so to speak, or you don't think most people are, you're in it because Bitcoin is right. And then, you know, what you alluded to at the end there about this kind of this order that's messed up, right? It's the people who are guilty walk free, the people who are innocent and not just innocent, but good, you know, they're either locked up or in hiding. And you have this kind of distortion of right and wrong, good and evil of, you know, the natural order, you could say, of the way things should be. And, you know, I had a conversation one time actually with our CEO, Maher, who's uh, listening in right now. You know, that was actually one of the main reasons that I, I told him I was in Bitcoin was because I do believe... And maybe this is a little esoteric, but I do believe that there's a natural order to the world. And once you see fiat and you see how it works and you see the corruption of money and how money touches all, and you see how it distorts literally everything. We're not talking finances, obviously, as you know, and as most people probably listening in know, you know, we're talking about healthcare. We're talking about education. We're talking about literally everything. You realize how this order is so distorted and corrupted and the harm that does to the world. So I just, I wanted to touch on that and I, I don't want it to see if you wanted to expand a little bit more on that, you know, not as much Bitcoin is charity or Bitcoin's about, you know, saving the world, what have you. It's more Bitcoin is just right. And that as a focus almost for you. Yeah. It's like, it's more basic, right? The sort of, you know, the ancients used to believe and I guess. This idea of like a moral dimension to the universe. And, you know, there's sort of these concepts of honor. There's a really good quote from, I think it's Chesterton, and I'm going to butcher this, but something about like, you know, we build men without chests and we last that honor and we wonder why we're surrounded by, you know, backstabbers and flakes or something like that. I completely butchered it, but that's essentially the idea is like, you know, modern man laughs at concepts like honor. Like you, you look at, you know, the, there's a particular subset of history that I'm studying now for a book that I'm writing uh, called The Bushido of Bitcoin, which is basically, you know, I'm writing a Bitcoin book. And it was funny, someone asked me, they're like, fuck, man, what are you going to write another history of money? I was like, hell to the fuck no, that shit's been written, yeah, you know, enough times. It's like, I'm, I want to write about the idea of like, if Bitcoin is supposedly going to win and Bitcoiners are essentially going to inherit the upper strata of the economic and social sort of class, who do we want to be, you know, do we want to be a bunch of retards driving around in fucking Lambos, you know, or politically minded shitheads twisting the rules in our favor again, you know, or do we want to have a moral code that we sort of live up to? And you know, the word Bushido is essentially like chivalry uh, in Japan. And it was a, uh, it was kind of like an unwritten code of the samurai in sort of the medieval feudal Japan. And, you know, there was eight virtues and one of them in there is honor. And it's really interesting how it evolved very similarly. But independently to honor and the chivalric codes, uh, in sort of Christendom and, uh, and the West. And anyway, like honor is like the virtue of nobility. It's this idea that, you know, your deeds and acts, uh, should be right. Not because someone's watching or cause you're going to get fucking brownie points on Instagram or anything like that, or because you're here to save the world and save the fucking babies. No, it's, it's to do the honorable thing is to do the right thing because it's fucking right. And because it's honorable and you sort of have this, you know, underlying sense of a moral dimension to the universe that, uh, you know, if you skew that, uh, and you continually do the wrong thing, you know, it, it has a broader effect, you know, just because someone didn't see you steal something doesn't mean there was, uh, you know, something sort of off about that. And anyway, yeah, I think sort of you know, while I wasn't thinking about that when I wrote that article, I guess it sort of came out in a, maybe in a subconscious sense. It's like, let's cut all the bullshit. Like, you know, let's tr stop trying to justify, you know, why Bitcoin's good, you know, whether it's, you know, crap about like, you know, ESG in the environment or, you know, like saving the babies or, you know, like Roger Ver used to cry about like all this sort of stuff. Like, let's just quit bullshitting. Like, you know, our mission is to liberate fucking, you know, mankind, but it's like, let's just do Bitcoin and choose Bitcoin because it's the right fucking thing to do. And because it means that you and your competitor can compete on a fucking level playing field, which will inevitably force you to become better. You know, if that's the sort of the standpoint that we choose it from, then all the other shit downstream will fix itself up. And, you know, we don't have to worry about these sort of grandiose bullshit things about like, you know, saving the babies.
Yeah, it almost eliminates the virtue signaling that that plagues society uh, today. And it just seems like it grows further by the day. And it's just it's more about doing what's right, not for your own personal incentives, but doing what's right for the sake of being right. Yeah, yeah the, virtue signaling, is, it, it comes from a place of guilt, right? It's like, you know, you're fucking wrong. So in order to make up for what you did, that was wrong. And whether that wrong is, you know, something as simple as you decided to eat fucking McDonald's and it was wrong. So then you do a tweet about how like, you know, the world must recycle. I, I don't know. I'm like obviously making shit up here, but like it's, you know, the wrongness comes in, you know, many sort of like levels and many dimensions. And it's like, if we just focus on like being right, doing right, you know, choosing Bitcoin because it's right. I think a lot of that downstream shit is just unnecessary. You don't need to virtue signal in that case. You know, virtue signaling, as we all know, it's, it, it's a lie. You know, if you're righteous, you don't need to signal about it. Yeah. Also in a Bitcoin, I would say, you know, everything comes at a cost, right? So virtue signaling, usually in my mind, it's a bunch of hot air, obviously that, you know, people want a pat on the back or some kind of moral superior complex or to feel, you know, something for nothing, right? So at no cost. That's why I think, you know, Bitcoiners rally around the proof of work concept because everything should come at a cost. And virtue signaling is kind of this cheap way of uh, feeling good about yourself or feeling morally superior without having to endure any of the costs. I think we see that totally. at a large level, obviously, in the federal government stage. It's very easy to say, I'm going to sign this piece of legislation and, uh, you know, take care of these oppressed, this oppressed group. And uh, here's what I did. And you didn't do anything besides take a pen to paper. You just you took from one group and gave it to another. None of it was yours. It came at no cost to you. And, you know, this obviously exists heavily at the federal government level, but it exists all across society and a fiat money regime. So, so yeah, I, I think that's the, uh, the focus there as far as what, what Bitcoin actually fixes. It forces a virtue to come at a cost. So then you actually see real virtue instead of the fake one that, that we're plagued with today. Totally. Yeah, I loved what you said about in your general takes on morality, because I'm always kind of come from a libertarian or free market think tank background, and I'm always getting in arguments with people about, uh, you know, moral relativism, nihilism, and how you can't really, you know, liberty is kind of meaningless unless you have this like a, a bill, you know, substantial moral ecology. And I think that I love that you harped on harp on that and make that point. And on that note, I wanted to talk with you more about this, uh, this remnant idea, because it's really this like old school, old right libertarian idea that Albert J. Nock, uh, comes up with in this essay, I Isaiah's job in the 20th century. And I saw, you know, I saw when you were writing about it a year ago, I was like, whoa, this is so cool. The remnant, right? And. I was wondering if you could talk about, you know, how you came across that, how, what inspired you to tie it into Bitcoin and, uh, you know, explain the general concept of the remnant and how it applies to Bitcoin for the audience. Yeah, sure. The idea came to me like through, uh, through Francis actually, or at least the article came to me through Francis, you know, the notion, uh, or the idea, you know, maybe is like, you know, embedded in people who share the archetype of the remnant, right? Of people who are the 1%. And, you know, I've sort of been on this whole crusade about, you know, redefining what it means to be a part of the one, you know, like, well, you know, ever since the soys and fucking leftist retards, uh, occupied wall street, you know, this idea of the 1%, you know, took a bad turn and, you know, what we, so we're like, we've even, uh, given them the word elite, like, you know, definition of the word elite is to be sort of the best at something. And, you know, being elite is actually a good thing. Uh, you know, you want to be the best program or the best footballer or the best husband, you know, or the best fucking at your gym or the best version of yourself that you can be like elitism is something to, you know, aspire towards. And we've basically, you know, given that designation to scumbags and parasites, uh, which, uh, anything but elite and you know we sort of created this uh, and i think this is you know much to do with like you know equality and democracy and all these sort of stupid ideas that have emerged in the last couple hundred years but you know these sort of ideas that you know somehow uh it's immoral or bad to be a select like part, be, to be part of the creme of the crop right like or to be part of the one percent and i actually think that's the best thing and what i tried to put forth was an argument that 
you know, at least generation of Bitcoiners, new generations won't fill this, uh, won't be filled by this type of archetypal person. But, you know, this generation of Bitcoiners are truly like different, not, you know, just the, you know, the get rich quick crypto fucking loser. They're not the dude that just wants to make some money on NSTs. You know, they're not the guy who's in his way, uh, you know, using derivatives to, to make a bunch of US dollars. Like they're fundamentally different kind of person. And, you know, Albert Knox's uh, essay, like I only read it for the first time in 2021. And it just spoke to me of this idea that, hey, you know, these true Bitcoiners, you know, they're a unique kind of person. They're a, they're not here to save everyone. Uh, you know, there's a lot less fluff here and a lot less fakeness. And, you know, what I argued was what Albert J. Nock argues in his, uh, in his essay is that, you know, our duty is not to try and make Bitcoin, you know, more fluffy and cute and accessible to everyone. It's to actually to maintain signal. And if that means we only actually speak to one out of a hundred people, then that one is worth more than the other 99 who walked past and didn't listen because those sheeple don't matter anyway. Like they, they're the ones who are going to just go and inject themselves and, you know, wear face diapers and do all it just because someone told them to. So they're not worthy of Bitcoin and they're not worthy of anyone's time to try and convince to buy Bitcoin either. So, and you know, I weaved in the whole idea of like the matrix and like, you know, you unplug those that are ready, right? You don't just go and unplug everyone. Is that there needs to be some reason to to get someone? Sorry, hold on, dog's going crazy. So, so yeah, so, so that was sort of the idea of remnant. Is like you know the idea of the, those who remain, and the remnant are those who are both. You know, they they have a sense for what's coming, and they prepare themselves for what's coming. So then, when there is a cataclysm, the ones who remain, i.e., the remnant, will not didn't remain just because they got fucking lucky. It's because they prepared and planned ahead. And in many ways, that's sort of what's happening in the world is like, you know, we're facing, uh, is, you know, bleaker and bleaker by the day. Uh, and what Bitcoin is doing is they are preparing will therefore, uh, most likely be the remnant, assuming they do more than just, you know, filling their coffers with, you know, sats, like instead, you know, leaving their keys on fucking computers and shit like that, you know, like some people recently. Uh, it might not be good. And if they're doing other stuff that's stupid, like eating poorly, you know, not building networks, you know, like being unhealthy, staying in the fucking dark instead of getting some shit, like all these other things, like, you know, if they're not building a family or strong friendships, et cetera, you know, they're not actually fully preparing. So that's, I hope the, you know, the Bitcoin uh, archetype and, you know, possibly the people listening to this you know, and others who've read the piece with that. And, you know, my whole call was, Save your time, save your brain, focus on those who matter, those who have sort of the right ingredients as an archetype. Forget about the lemmings and the masses, you know, you're not gonna, someone who's still wearing masks, like, you know, three years later, for example, like the idiots that I just got uh, arrested on another fucking flight a couple of days ago, another bucket list item for me. But, uh, like, you know, those people, they're just not gonna, they're not gonna matter. Who cares? Like they'll walk into the gulag with a smile on their face and they'll walk into a world which is more right and robust with a smile on their face, and they'll have no fucking clue how they got to either. So, you know, our job is not to fix or save or help them. Our job is to sort the shit out, you know, for ourselves, and the lemmings will get the benefit just because breathing oxygen. That's it. That's all they have to do. Alex, I really love that concept. I guess my next question would be, do you... So I always go back to things like Bitcoin Beach, right? And I'm not that close to it. I just know the story from afar. And I just, I wonder with that, with those thoughts in mind that you just shared, is it something where we just ignore or is it something where we gradually form our own kind of Bitcoin beaches or we just, you know, uh, find ourselves near like-minded people, not near unlike-minded people, or is it just more of an individual approach on how to live life? Cause I'm. You know, if I could just, I'll give you an example. Like I, today I had to go to, uh, I had to go to the doctor for my newborn. She's uh, two months old and, you know, we go to this doctor's office and to your point, I try to stay away from, well, I'll get into it. You know, we're wearing masks and they have the directions on the floor still, right? And this is supposed to be a place of medicine, place of science, and we're still doing this whole charade. And I'm just wondering. How can I get the heck out of here? Like, like this is a place, whatever this place is, I don't want to be here. 
I, I don't belong here and you know, I'll, I'm worse than my wife is with it or better, whichever way you look at it. And, uh, yeah, I just wonder like, you know, where does that ultimately go? Cause I love the concept, right? I love to ignore them and focus on what we're doing. I'm just curious, like where it leads to. I don't know, man. I'm still experimenting, you know, last couple of years, my answer was ridicule the shit out of them. And, you know, I think maybe that wasn't the right thing to do because it, I mean, maybe it was because, you know, who knows, maybe we've actually had some wins, you know, this whole weird timeline of Elon taking over Twitter and, you know, the discourse changing, you know, maybe as a function of like the constant ridicule and, you know, maybe that's over now, maybe we move on to the next stage of the fight, which is ignore the fuckers and treat them like the ants that they are like, and then, you know, like let them disappear and dissolve into their own oblivion. Uh, but you know, as you said, it's a little bit tricky, like, you know, I did my best to ignore the mask mandate on the plane and they called the fucking federal police when we landed. You know, I was very nice about it. So, you know, I spoke to the cops, blah, 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 blah. And in the end, they didn't do nothing. They just shook my hand and they're like, they nudged me. They're like, you're right. These people are fucking idiots. So, you know, they are out there, I guess. So I don't know. I'm trying a new strategy this year, which is, you know, more focus on me, you know, less involvement with the noise online, you know, more ignorance, honestly, selective ignorance, you know, how does that evolve longer term? Like, and how do we, you know, potentially build communities around that and stuff like that? I don't know. I think what, one thing I will mention, you mentioned the word like-minded, and this is something I've been trying to popularize uh, in the last couple of years is the idea of focusing on finding like-valued people, not like-minded, uh, is a little bit different. It's like, you, you want, you know, very multivariance in sort of the mindedness of people, like to so the you know, more mechanically minded, some people to be more, you know, philosophy minded, etc. But you want some sort of, you want a strong similarity of values. And I don't know, like I said, it's a tricky one because, you know, we, we have these sort of digital formats, you know, which are good for sort of identifying things early on, but nothing really beats like physical uh, environments. You know, women really need to spend time with women and sort of build up, you know, uh, their sort of friendships and stuff like that with, you know, women, because women value things differently than men value things. And, you know, men need to start building up, you know, this idea of the manner blend again, like this sort of, this tribe of, you know, brothers that'll do anything for each other. And that like, I think about this a lot, you know, in reading ancient texts about like Alexander the Great, for example, or the Spartans, you know, they didn't go to war with, you know, their girlfriend, like the dudes went out and they went and they fucking fought and they would have died for each other. And that kind of like connection and brotherhood it doesn't really exist these days, gangs. The problem is like, you know, there's a great saying, it's like, uh, morality is concerned with what you do, honor is concerned with how you do it. So like, there is still actor in gangs, but there's no, you know, there's a lack of morality, which is why, you know, sort of gangs are like a, an echo of the past. But anyway, going off on tangents there, so it's like, you know, maybe the point there is, you know, we need to sort of build these, uh, hopefully find like value people around us or go to where they are and establish deeper relationships, you know, that doesn't need to be quantity. There needs to be quality. Like, you know, your fucking Twitter followers and your Instagram followers aren't your friends, like your friends and the people who matter are those who will sacrifice for you. And that's quite rare. And that takes time to build and that takes, you know, a deep overlap of values. And I honestly think that takes physical presence, not just sort of a digital connection. So yeah, no clear answer, still experimenting, still trying to figure that out myself, man. Yeah, like uh, like value instead of, I'm going to pick that up. I, I like that a lot better because it's actually what I intended to say. And I think it's a lot more accurate. The last thing I'd say on that is I like what Safety and says, and he's, I believe he says it in the Bitcoin standard. He says, it's impossible to let yourself from the consequences of others holding money that's harder than yours. So I guess whether it's, you know, this kind of explicit where everybody, we separate, so to speak, and one goes one, one group goes one way, the other goes the other, or many different groups, you know, maybe it's just this gradual return to order in society. And maybe Bitcoin obviously plays the major role in that, in hard money versus fiat. It does. A lot of our problems, I have to boil them down, they're all temporal problems, meaning that like, you know, unfortunately, sort of seismic, you know, social and civilizational shifts like this take fucking decades and centuries and, you know, multiple generations, you know, and, you know, possibly even millennia, right? Like thing, this shit takes time. And just unfortunately we've only got like, you know, 80, 100, 120 years on this planet. So, you know, a bunch of our lifetime is going to be filled with the day-to-day -day fucking minutia, which actually doesn't matter. And, you know, like a lot of this stuff will get cleaned up. A lot of the stupidity will disappear and all that sort of stuff. Like we'll find our way to these, you know, these, et cetera. But, you know, 
it's just bitch that you know week to you know a, a day is too short for anything to change so is a week so is a year it's like you know a decade is really the measuring stick that we need to use and that that's just hard to do when you're a human mm-hmm. like when it wide that way yeah i i flip back and forth between how fast we're moving versus how slow we're moving right i think i feel like on on every other day i feel like it's not coming fast enough and then some other days i look back and i'm like holy shit like we're moving here and we don't appreciate how much we're moving yeah, I mean, sort of. I used to think that, you know, think things do move faster. I think technology gives us the, the false feeling that we're moving faster than we are. But I think culture takes a long, t- longer time to shift because it is generational and we're just going to have to live with the fact that, you know, that this, like, you know, the world moving onto a different unit of account is a generational shift. You know, I'm sorry, but it's not going to happen in, you know, this decade, you know, maybe next, maybe the following one, et cetera. But basically, My guess is it's a sort of three generation thing. Like I came up with this while I was talking to someone the other day. I was like, you know, we're the generation that sets the foundation, like the first generation, the first 20 years of Bitcoin is like, we establish its roots. Then the next generation is essentially going to be when they come of age, like 20 and you know, they're the innovators, they're the movers, they're the shakers. They're the ones like starting to make moves. They will have been born the same fucking time Bitcoin came out. Right? Like, so so they're going to, they're going to move it to the next stage. And then their children, by the time they're 20, so the third generation is going to live in a world where Bitcoin is a normalized thing. So for them, then it sort of becomes sort of the bedrock. And I think, like I said, I don't think there's any escaping the fact that this is going to take a little bit of time. And yeah, like the Twitterverse and technology in general, I think, you know, maybe confuses us into, you know, shortening our time span when in reality, we need to be thinking a little bit longer term. Yeah, I like that. And it kind of reminded me actually of a conversation that uh, you and I were having, Joe, about and and where, what like geographic region is really going to spearhead that. And, you know, I think we can both agree that it's probably not going to be the West. That's that even though there's probably a lot of Bitcoin, you know, companies in the West, you know, the people aren't really going to drive that adoption in terms of at least using it as a medium of exchange. And Alex, I was wondering, you know, you've traveled globally over the past few years, or it looks like you have pretty extensively. And I was wondering how that kind of plays into how you view adoption from a geographic standpoint and how you've observed people use Bitcoin differently in each of the countries that you visited. Well, to be honest, I just don't think most people care at this point. You know, I've traveled to like 40 countries in the last three years and, you know, most people still just view Bitcoin as like a investment more than anything else, which tells me we're still very squarely in, a, in the realm of like establishing Bitcoin as money still like as savings, you know, Bitcoin is still in the speculation phase by and large. And that's even in poorer countries. Like, you know, my parents are from Macedonia. I went there, they view it as an investment. They're like, oh, it's risky. You know, like, like th- they don't think about payments or anything like that. You know, Brazil, same thing, Costa Rica, same thing. You know, even people in Salvador where it's like a payment, you know, it's legal tender. They still think of it as like a risky thing that goes up and down in price, you know, relative to what they still perceive as money, which is the US dollar or the euro in Europe, for example. So, so that kind of tells me we've got a long way to go. Like, yes, there's, you know, cool stuff happening, you know, pairing for medium, but you know, if we're thinking in this generational model that I mentioned before, it's like, that's still a ways away. Now. Mind you, I will say I've you know, never been to Africa. You know, I hear that things are a little bit different there. But once again, I think it's probably easy to get carried away with like a, an article about, you know, how a couple of kids are using Bitcoin in Nigeria and then think that the whole country is all of a sudden using Bitcoin. You know, I think a lot of people are carried away that way with like Salvador. And when you go there, you know, there's nothing much of that happening. And that's not to say, once again, it's not that what Bukele did was, you know, bad or wrong or anything like that. It's just that it's going to fucking take time. That's it. And you know, I wrote an article back in 2020 called uh, Bitcoin and Lockdowns, and I put forward this sort of model of understanding Bitcoin adoption through the lens of necessity. And what it said was, it's like, hey, people will adopt Bitcoin because they fucking need it, not because they want to. And, you know, maybe in different places, in different jurisdictions, that need is going to manifest in a different way. It's like, okay, uh, sorry, bro, you can't send money to, to your family. Okay, well, in that case, I need something that I can send money internationally then you know had that problem like the need originally was fucking silk road it's like people wanted to buy drugs so they needed a way to pay for shit and that's what they used so it really fulfilled that's how you get a killer app 
is with a need, not with just a want. So, you know, maybe as inflation sort of starts to occur in places, like people will sort of jump to it as a safe haven. But, you know, probably we'll see, you know, stablecoin, USD shitcoins like USDC and stuff like that. You know, they'll probably, you know, pick up a lot of the store value piece. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, Bitcoin may just stay in sort of speculation phase for a little while but then you know as things tighten up you know cbds come in and you know when people get the first taste of oh shit i can't spend my money because i didn't i don't know save even credits this week or i've bartered too many times or whatever the fuck else happens you know based on the cbdc's then they'll start thinking twice about oh fuck you know maybe i need to use money that i can send to someone you know without someone measuring it you know and then last of all you know late second generation third generation you know is thinking about using Bitcoin purely as your unit of account. And, you know, obviously some of us Bitcoin weirdos are living in the future already. We measure everything in sats and that's fine, but you know, we're just sort of ahead of the curve. You know, not that it's useful to measure anything in sats at the moment, but hey, we do it. It makes us feel better. So we'll just keep doing it. And yeah, I guess it, it's just, yeah, need. And I, we don't know how that needs going to manifest in different countries, but it surely will as the status quo Fucks itself over. You mentioned the status quo there, actually. And that's interesting because we, you know, we've been hearing about BRICS a lot lately. And again, I love your point about reading uh, an article and then thinking, you know, it's, uh, it perfectly depicts the entire world uh, or that region, you know, when it's just one, it's simply one example. But, you know, we've had, and we have the newsletter, uh, the Coinbase newsletter. So, you know, we stay up on this kind of stuff and more news is coming out about the BRICS nations and them working towards a new currency that works outside of the dollar. And, you know, it just had me thinking like, no matter the degree of the validity of that, which I think there is a lot of validity as far as maybe them trying to circumvent and needing to use the dollar. I was just wondering if you have a world where the countries, where countries are trying to escape the dollar because they realize, you know, how it's been quote unquote weaponized or what have you, you know, is the natural leap there Bitcoin ultimately, or, you know, is it back to, you know, maybe some countries going back to a gold-based currency or, you know, like, does that, does something like that speed up Bitcoin adoption as, you know, the world, the global neutral currency? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not too bullish on this sort of BRICS currency or whatever they're trying to do. Like each of those countries are fucking retarded anyway, you know, in the way they do everything. So like you know, them rolling out a functional currency and actually getting the faith of their people to sort of, you know, put their money in there. They're basically going to have the same problem Bitcoin's having, which is people don't sort of perceive it as money. And, and I think the US dollar is just way too strong for that. And most like, you know, the US isn't going to want to see that happening either. So they'll probably do things like, you know, partner up with the USDCs and stable coins of the world because there's already quite a bit of penetration globally about that with that shit. And they'll probably try and, you know, market USDC as, you know, the stable coin, the better one. Yeah. And, you know, they'll probably partner with Ethereum and shit and, you know, give it some bells and whistles and make sure that you can't spend it if you haven't saved enough carbon credits or whatever else they're going to sort of think about. But yeah, I just don't have, I don't think they're going to, the BRICS people are going to pull it off. And, you know, and how does that impact, you know, Bitcoin? I don't know. Like I said, you know, maybe, yeah, you, know, you might have this sort of failed BRICS currency, you know, increasingly failing Euro, uh, a really strong US dollar, USDC and, you know, speculation power through Bitcoin until it sort of, you know, really gets to maturity. And then, you know, the US dollar will probably be the one that kills itself by uh, instituting things like you can't spend your money if you didn't do X, Y, Z. And that's where, you know, I think it'll, the ultimate battle will then be sort of uh, Bitcoin and US dollar. But who knows? I could be talking straight out of my ass, which I am, and I could be completely wrong, which I probably am. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, as I am too. And I would just say, um, you know, with bricks, I think you nailed it actually. Like there's trust, re there's trust required there. And I don't think China and Russia and whoever else is going to gain that trust from the rest of the world, uh, using their currency, so to speak. The other end of that, I think is if there's utility there, if there's, you know, whether it's China's manufacturing or Russian energy and the world deems that to be valuable, you know, how do you acquire that if you're not going to use their currencies? And 
I think there might be a case. I think there is a case for Bitcoin there. Now, I don't know how that plays out, though, like you yeah, said. Yeah, the buying of goods and services and sort of like them saying, hey, well, look, you know, we're not going to accept dollars for this, but we'll accept this currency. You know, there's maybe something there for those BRICS nations, perhaps. You know, you know that's maybe something that they've got up their sleeve is the fact that, you know, they do have uh, some sort of you know, manufacturing or natural resources that they can uh, demand payment in their brick shit coin for but i mean who are they going to be demanding payment from anyway it's like you know it's the europeans and the americans that are buying everything so you know the like imagine if you're a business and you're like look i'll only accept you know these bills for payment for my services and your customer comes in and doesn't have those bills what are you going to do turn him away I think you'll probably try and figure out a way to accept that money and swap it if you need to. So, so I think it's a, it's tricky. It's tricky. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. If I could just jump in here, Alex, I love, uh, I love basically your realism and your humility, but you, you know, you're talking about this kind of how it'll take, you know, generations for this kind of vision of hyper Bitcoinization or whatever you want to call it as we see it to play. So with that in mind, I'm wondering, you know, what your thoughts are on the most important things for Bitcoin companies to be building, uh, in anticipation of that, even if it's a really long, a long game and, you know, whether that's like lightning stuff, custody stuff, or, you know, ease to acquire Bitcoin, whatever that is, just what kind of want to pick your brain on that. Oh man, I still think, you know, what you guys are doing, you know, what I tried to build in Australia with Amber and. You know, Relay and Swans of the world, all that. I still think that's probably, you know, still the most important application because, you know, the mental image I always try and give people is the, uh, you've got this sort of new island, this new promised land. You need to get there. And in the new promised land, you know, things are working better and they're, you know, differently functional, but they're like, it operates on a, you know, on a different set of physical laws, right? Like physics is different over there than it is over here. And, you know, what these on-ramp products are is essentially a bridge between both worlds. And on one side of the bridge, like the part that connects the old world, you know, there's all sorts of surveillance shit going on and there's, you know, regulation and all this sort of crap mired and it's like all held together by, you know, fucking duct tape and plastic pipe work. And then on the other side, you know, it has the opportunity to build interesting different architecture based on, you know, the physical laws of that side of, uh, the world or that, that realm. And there, you know, things like lightning, et cetera, you know, other digital primitives, other business primitives, you know, make a whole lot more sense. Yeah, there'll be stuff to build down there. But the thing is, there's not a real critical of ma critical mass of people on that side yet on that new island in that new land. So, you know, the question then just becomes a strategic one is, you know, what do you want to build on that side? Uh, and how much resource do you want to put in it? Knowing that it's going to take a hell of a long time for there to be any critical of people on that side willing to use and pay for your products and services. Cause most of the people that are going there now don't want to pay for shit because they, you know, they're all nerdy and everything. They can figure it out themselves. So there's not a lot of money to be made there, but you also know that you've actually got a bridge on your side that's connected to the old world at some point because it's going to get so fucked up to keep it there. And you might let, uh, you know, the wrong people in or, you know, somehow the bridge might get compromised. So, you know, the goal is to, well, I don't know what the goal is, you know, the challenge is to, to know what to do. So I'm not sure, like, as I said, I still think, uh, the on-ramps make a hell of a lot of sense. You know, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. I am not smart enough to know what else to do. Otherwise I would be doing it, which I'm not. So yeah. Shit answer. I'm sorry. No, not at all. I mean, I, I realized I was lobbing you like a, a really a tough question. And I think I love how you said promised land and it really kind of clicked with me. It's also like Noah's Ark in a sense, like, uh, rather than, you know, like building the Ark for people. Uh, and so I think that also applies. So you cut out just for a second there. What was that last thing you said? Oh, that it's like maybe less like leading people to the promised land and more like building Noah's Ark for them? Yeah. What, what are the two, I, the, you know, the, I don't know, it's basically some way to get from, you know, the world today, which operates on one set of physical laws to the world tomorrow, which operates on another set of physical laws. So like, and they're just trouble with each other. That's the reason I sort of use the different worlds theories. Like, you know, in the paradigm of Bitcoin, like shit is incompatible with the paradigm of fiat. Like they just don't mix well together. And that's why these 
you know, whether it's Coinbits or Amber or all this sort of stuff, like we're building these fucking Frankenstein products, which talk to both worlds because we have to, you know, not because it really, you know, really fucking makes sense. You know, it makes sense because we're in the transition, you know, hundred years from now, you know, 200 years from now, people are going to be like, there was currency exchange apps. What a fucking dumb idea. Who the hell would do that? Like, why would we use currency exchange apps when everyone's on Bitcoin? Like, it's going to seem so fucking retarded a couple of hours. But hey, you know, it's quite necessary at the moment. So, you know, we're all building these weird Frankensteins because, you know, that's the opportunity. That's the period we're in. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. And I really like your long-term view and how it definitely, it does challenge, I think, the consensus of a lot of Bitcoiners because I think a lot of us uh, you know, because we're so invested in the space, we really want it to play out a lot faster. But your view challenges that. And you've already touched on this earlier, but I wanted to, you know, another kind of tough question is, you know, what do you think will, like, what trends do you think will define Bitcoin in the short term going forward? Like, uh, you know, whether it's 2023 or the next, you know, few years, I guess. Uh, what do you mean by trends like world trends or trends within Bitcoin? What do you mean? Yeah, I guess like, so, you know, this year we saw, uh, you know, Ethereum basically castrated itself. Then, uh, then in addition, we saw, you know, the casinos mostly all collapse. And then, you know, all of those, they aren't, they don't really have anything to do with Bitcoin, but they're related and just like how, and then Bitcoin also, you know, had a pretty big downturn, but really held stable. You know, it shook off a lot of junk, did this detox. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, what you think will define how, I guess, how people view Bitcoin going forward in, in the short term, in terms of like mm -hmm. narratives. I mean, short term, I think it's going to be people getting bored with Bitcoin and then looking for something else. I hope chat GPT kind of like takes away all the people that came to get rich quick on Bitcoin, <laughs> they go and build their stupid courses or whatever the fuck else they're going to do with it. So, but yeah, I think probably short term, it's, you know, the narrative that'll define Bitcoin is that it's, you know, we're bored and the world is moving on to something else. And that's when we'll know we're truly sort of in the final innings of the bear market is, you know, boredom is the ultimate sort of end game. It's like, yeah, Bitcoin's just floating around and doing nothing and thereby, you know, obviously everything else is also doing nothing. So, all right, we're off to do other things. And then, you know, we'll, you know, the narratives, you know, will probably shift around 2024. It's like, oh, you know, the halving's coming, you know, we'll probably hear some noise and shit again. Like, yeah, it's, uh, now's the time to buy Bitcoin again, you know, because the halving and, you know, it's largely going to be ignored initially, but because of you know, just physics and supply cap and all that sort of shit, you know, it's going to start nudging things up again. And only then will at some point, you know, if Bitcoin cracked 50K again, or sorry, when 50, 60, whatever K again, only then will the narrative start to shift. It's like, okay, the Bitcoin bull run is on again. We all thought this was dead, blah, blah. And then, I mean, at this point, I guess I'm a little bit jaded. You know, I didn't think, I thought, the 2017, 2018 ICO stupidity peak Duncan, but then we got, you know, another peak of Duncan in 2022 with like, you know, everything from Celsius to, you know, like programmatic stable coins, whatever that means. And God knows what else. So we had all the same shit again. So I'm curious, you know, I think probably the same sort of flavor, just a different, you know, or the same thing, but a different flavor again, you know, we'll probably see. And my guess is, you know, it comes back to what I said earlier is that I still think we're probably in the speculation phase of Bitcoin. You know, we are still probably quite early and I don't see that, uh, that changing, at least not in the short term. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're running a little overtime here with, uh, 10 minutes past the hour, but I just want to ask one more thing, Alex, if you have a little bit couple more minutes and then, and then we can wrap here, you know, and this kind of goes in the same vein of what we've been talking about. And I think, you know, we, I think a lot of Bitcoiners that have always said, if we had good money, we wouldn't need Bitcoin, so to speak. Right. I say that one way or another, uh, you know, if the federal reserve operated monetary policy, you know, with, uh, in a responsible fashion, you know, if we maybe, if the gold standard worked out the way it was supposed to, and we didn't get taken off it, we wouldn't really need Bitcoin, but that's obviously not the case. And I think anybody living in reality 
knows that's never going to be the case. So we do need Bitcoin. We do need a trustless money. And, you know, we, I think we all go back and forth with this adoption phase and how long it's going to take. And I think there's a good case really for everybody's point of view, as far as the length of time and far be it for me to know, far be it from anyone to know. I know you were very humble about that too. One thing I just want to comment on here, because this is newsworthy or was newsworthy in the past few weeks. And you start to just contemplate how long this clown world can continue before reality, uh, you know, steps in. And, you know, we had this one point seven trillion dollar new spending bill in the United States. And a lot of different line items started making their way through the news in the last few weeks. And you start seeing where this absurd amount of money is actually going, right? And to put things in perspective, when we bailed out the banks in 2008, that number, I believe, was like 800 billion. And now we're just, and that was, you know, the bailout of the entire financial system. Now we're talking about 1.7 trillion in spending for the upcoming year. And, you know, one of these line items, for example, is just, just to provide context, $200 million for the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund. Okay. $200 million <laughs> for the Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund. I, Lord knows whatever that means. Uh, there's $200 million going to it though. $200 million that, you know, is just conjured up out of thin air, right? Printed out of thin air. Then you have a bunch of other bee-friendly highways. I don't even know what that is. Opera, fire alarms. You know, there's all of this just distortion, right? There's all of this full misallocation of resource. And it seems to just get increasingly laughable by the year. So I guess my, you know, that was a long roundabout way of asking the question, posing the question, how long can this clown world exist before we implement some fiscal responsibility or, you know, reality sets in, right? And says no more, right? The natural order says no more. This is insane. It's all going to fall apart and the world chooses a better way. And I'd like to think shorter than longer, obviously, right? I'd like to think sooner than later, but I don't know. I, it just seems to get more clownish as we go. And you just have to think that it really can't continue on for much longer. Yeah, I appreciate the easy question, man. Uh, fuck. I mean, I don't think the world says shit because I guess that sort of almost implies that somehow people are going to get together and, you know, make a collective decision. And I don't think shit ever works out very well. So that's probably one piece. I think maybe, m maybe if I had to rephrase the question to answer it as like, you know, how's the insanity or the peak stupidity sort of last? And my guess is that this decade is going to be the decade of madness because like you've also got to realize like you know the nancy pelosi's and the biden's and the klaus schwab's and all that sort of stuff of the world like this is their last decade on the planet say that people are going to be assassinated or anything like before i get assassinated here but it's like they're fucking old they're all about to kick the bucket you know a couple more years you know they're all sort of going to start disappearing that sort of as that old guard comes in you know the new guard is going to want to do something else and you know the new guard like you know, while there is like similarities to a lot of their thinking, you know, the Justin Trudeau's of the world, etc. like, you know, they're increasingly becoming irrelevant. Like you see him post a tweet and it just gets ratioed, right? So I don't know. My First of all, I don't think we do it collectively. I don't think there's like a line in the sand. I think it's like a diffusion effect where, you know, pockets of sanity sort of remain and you know, may maybe it almost looks like fucking Twitter in a sense. It's like there seems to be some sort of change in the discourse. And, you know, maybe that's what we see. And then the stupidity is sort of drowned out at some point by more sanity. But I definitely think it's, we've got a longer way to go, at least an individual's lifespan, right? Short on a generational timescale and short on a, you know, social and civilizational timescale. So maybe this decade is when we see, you know, the madness sort of like really peak. And next decade is when we sort of get a chance to start really laying, laying some foundations. And then the decade after that is when, uh, we can see an up volume, I guess. Yeah. Agreed. And I guess the last thing I would just add to that is I think Bitcoin probably expedites the process to whatever degree, just because we now have an option to stop the madness, at least in my opinion. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, and I guess, you know, tying it back to the remnant concept, all we can really do is just keep putting out and focus on being the best version of ourselves, mm -hmm. which I think is a kind of a powerful di way if you're liberty minded to, to not, you know, turn into that like Joker character, basically. <laughs> totally. <laughs> With it. Yeah, absolutely.
Yeah. Well, Alex, I wanted to, you know, just thank you so much for your time. This was really, you know, deep and kightening conversation, uh, I think for our audience and definitely for me. And, you know, before, before we head out, you know, just wanted to say we're Coinbits, uh, the best way to orange pill your pre-coin or friends and family. You can find us on that app and out to say, you know, give a quick line about where we can find you, where you write and any upcoming projects that you have. Yes, for sure. So, you know, if people found some insight here, I, I recommend they check out Timeless Bitcoin on Twitter. That's a... Uh, it's a publication that I run called the Bitcoin Times and like a limited edition collectible edition. Uh, well, sorry, it's a limited edition collectible publication uh, of Bitcoin essays compiled best. So I got some one was, so I do one a year. Uh, the recent one was the Austrian edition and that's got Safer Dean in it. I got Bitstein out of hibernation to write his first piece after a couple of years. Pierre Rashad, Raheem Tagazadegan, who's actually a direct student of Hans Hermann Hopper, you know, his last student before he stopped teaching, and Conrad Graf, who's like an early Bitcoiner, one of the first people who linked Austrian economics and Bitcoin back in 2013. So some really good pieces there. People can get the collectible or they can get digital copy. And yeah, I do one of those a year. That's sort of what I'm working on these days. And then, as I said, I'm writing a new book called The Bushido of Bitcoin, which will be out in a couple months, hopefully by the time the Miami conference rolls around. So they're the two things at the moment. I had no idea you did the Bitcoin Times. That's amazing. I, that, if, seriously, anybody in the audience, Bitstein's piece toward a node world order is incredible. I would really, just echoing what you just said, Alex, that's a, it's a must read publication. Thanks, man. Yeah. And if people want to support the work, yeah, pick up the collectible. I'd love the sets and, and you will love the piece itself. Like they're, they're all numbered. They're all unique. There's 2,100 of each. So, so yeah, the fucking pieces are solid. Love it, Alex. Thank you for your time. This was an awesome conversation. And until next time, I hope we talk again soon. But take care until next time. And uh, appreciate everybody listening in. This was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. And thank you for listening. Appreciate it. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Bitcoin Roundup podcast presented by Coinbits. So what do you think of the conversation? Share your thoughts with us on Twitter at Coinbits app. And be sure to subscribe to be notified of our next episode release. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time on the Bitcoin Roundup Podcast.